Hey everybody, welcome to the B2B Revenue Leadership Podcast. Hey, what we do on this podcast is talk about what B2B sales and marketing uh, leaders, operators, and experts are doing today to really break through and grow their businesses at exponential levels. Let's get it in the interview. At the end, I'll give you an update on my courses and you can check out my website at b2brevenue.com and it's Brian G. Burns on LinkedIn. Hey, Steve, welcome to the show. As a way of getting started, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, uh, I live, uh, as we were just discussing, in Atlanta, Georgia. i uh, been here for 40 plus years. Uh, married uh, to uh, Deborah. I have two boys, Zach and Joey. Uh, Zach's down at Georgia Tech. Joey's a rising freshman at Georgia Southern. And uh, Ben selling software for my entire career <laughs> just a few decades huh yeah that's right <laughs> you're, you're almost warmed up huh <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm starting to get the hang of it <laughs> and how'd you get into software uh i was always big into tech it uh i went to uh i actually went to georgia tech but uh, i failed out uh, which was a great learning experience and then i moved to uh, university of georgia up in athens where I was a consultant in the Mac lab, uh, you know, just to earn, earn money. I was a business major, but worked in the Mac lab <clears throat> and really enjoyed the technology aspect of, of you know, just helping people. Um, but I didn't want to get into the MIS piece of, of that, that segment of the business world. So that's how it all started. Yeah. And then how did you get into sales? Uh, well, it was, the, it was the first job. This is actually an interesting story, Brian. At, at University of Georgia, you remember the course um, Spin Selling? I think it was Neil Rackman. Yeah. So <clears throat> Georgia actually had an entire course dedicated to spin selling. So for an, a, an entire semester, you took spin selling. And that was my first exposure um, to what I would call professional selling. My first exposure to sales in general was from my father, who... Uh, was in the trucking business or the labor leasing business. So they leased truck drivers to other companies. They didn't own the trucks. And um, he was an accountant by trade, but he always told me since the very youngest I can remember, you're always selling, Stephen, regardless of what you do for a living. So that was my first exposure to sales. And I yeah. kind of lived with that in my house. And then my first professional exposure was that uh, was that course at University of Georgia, and I didn't really realize that there were strategies, you know, behind that, you know, the, the entire profession. Yeah, and I think spin is usually kind of the first book a lot of people pick up, and and questions, you know, I think help people a lot because it gets you away from the pitch. Right. Yeah. I agree. And and then you kind of flow through a sequence. You know, I, I, you know, I like it a lot. I actually, well, the interesting thing about that course too, is we had to do role plays. So think about this, you know, 20 years old, you know, exposed to role plays, you know, in, in front of, you know, groups of people, the rest of the class. And it, was, it wasn't a big class because this was junior, senior year. So say, you know, 30 or so people. And that's when I was like, this is kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah. And what got you into Oracle? Uh, so, uh, well, I, my early in my career, I was at startups. I was at small companies yeah. um, selling software. And there was a group of us, I'd say 10 to 12 of us. We had a leader. We had like a sales operations person. We had a couple of SEs. And my role was kind of what, you know, I'd call the, the whale hunter. So they would give me the, the large accounts to kind of go after. And we would go to these small companies, Series A, Series B round funded companies. And this was pre-2000. So again, I'm dating myself. Um, but we would plug in and plug out as a group every 18 or so to 24 months. Um, after doing, I think we had three or four really good runs and it was post 2000. I was like, you know, I'd like to try my hand at a larger, you know, company. And I talked to Oracle a couple of times. They, um, they said, I don't have the profile, right? I was <laughs> startup guys. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so, you know, I uh, wasn't from SAP or PeopleSoft or, or Siebel or any of those companies. So they said no, actually twice. And then um, a recruiter called a third time around, ironically, for the transportation team, which I had zero experience except for my father being in that. Business. <laughs> yeah, that counts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And, uh, and I just met the right hiring manager, to be honest with you. So you think about some of the breaks you get. Um, and uh, this guy uh, was out of Houston, and I think he saw value in, in being a scrappy startup, you know, mindset with the combination of a, 
of a big company, Oracle, and uh, and that's how I started at, at Oracle. And I was there for for ten years and rose up to be a fourth line executive over over that period of time. I'll say this comment because I tell that story when people ask. Is I actually thought that that mix because it worked for me was a good mix. Like, okay, let's look for the startup folks with that kind of scrappy mindset. Um, and I found out that I was kind of 50, 50 because the big companies can, um, uh, you know, really kind of take a lot of energy out of the startup mindset. You know what I mean? So it's, it's kind of a, an interesting marriage when it works. It, it is. And it's rare to see somebody like yourself, uh, have a, such a great run there because you know, I, I was on the startup side too, and then got acquired by a portfolio company and you're just overwhelmed and you're like, it wasn't me. Right. And, uh, and you just, you can just tell. Right. Um, how did you make your home there? How did you make it work for you? At Oracle? Yeah. So, so it was, um, <laughs> Again, you kind of talk about breaks. Uh, so when I started, I started the transportation vertical, as I mentioned, and then, you know, quickly after that, as a big company, there was a significant reorganization. And I came into, I came into every the, hour. <laughs> right. Right. So I came into another team and my, my manager at first really didn't like me. And, uh, and uh, we were, we were doing a deal uh, with a railroad down in Florida and, uh, and, you know, he was having a tough quarter. It was one of those things where, uh, you know, I happened to have a really great quarter and the team did really, really well. And I went from kind of being, all right, this, who's this kind of outsider to, you know, part of the team and then really started to, you know, get involved with the ethos of the company and started to, you know, meet our executives, you know, which was critical. And then when I ultimately went to Salesforce, it was a similar you know, a very, very similar thing. So it was, it was just kind of getting ingrained with the, the culture, um, you know, the ethos of, of the companies. And what motivated you to move up the org versus be the elephant hunter? Uh, great question. Um, I didn't have goals of being in leadership. Um, yeah, it's, it's like it's doing well. But when you saw how much fun they were having, you had to do it, right? <laughs> right. And, um, and so uh, it was like a second or third line executive. We were at a customer event. It was a golf event in, in Florida that Oracle had sponsored. And, you know, it was like, hey, have you ever thought of getting into leadership? And I was like, no. And uh, at the time, <clears throat> uh, he was like, I think you'd be great at it. And um, so I was like, I'd love to consider it. And the, they had a spot that had opened. And, and, uh, and I went for it and got it. The interesting thing was, you know, I made every mistake you could make that first year. And I always tell this to first line managers. It's kind of funny, like when people are interviewing and they want to get into leadership, like that's one of their goals or objectives, uh, the yeah, objectives, uh, you know, the objection they get is, well, you don't have experience. I'm like, you're right. <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody does, right? That first job, you just don't have that experience. And, um, and you have to have someone willing to kind of take a bet on you and, you know, coach you up through that, for, through that year one. And how was it? What was it like? It was great. I mean, we had a good year. You know, what's hard for me is that it was one of those situations where I got promoted to run my team that I was on. Okay. <clears throat> and I will say, if any of my old team watches this, they were fantastic. Um, but oftentimes they're not. Um, right. You know what I mean? So, so I went from being a part of the crew to now leading the crew. And even though you still think you know, your, your friends, you're, you're kind of the boss now. And, um, and again, that team was great, uh, through that transition, but that was, uh, some headwind, you know, that I faced. And then outside of that, it's the typical, you know, the, the policy stuff, the HR stuff, like all the things that, you know, you don't have to, you know, learn as a, as a rep or you need to be aware of, you know, how to, how to get that down. So my early years as a leader, you know, I kind of over rotated and I've watched your videos a ton. I over rotated to the operational side of the business and to the policy side of the business and the spreadsheet side of the business, you know, and then, you know, finally settled in, you know, hopefully found a, a nice middle ground. Yeah. Because that can be a trap because it's kind of like the easy path as yeah. opposed to the hard path. And I had a, a great leader from another portfolio company and he just separated leadership from management. Yep. And he goes, I'm a leader. I hire people to do management. Yep. I and, agree with that. <laughs> yeah. And rare do you see that because you find a lot of great admins, operations and managers. <laughs> right. Right. Agreed. 
And the problem is sales is got a part of that. You have to do it, but that's not what brings the revenue in. Oh, hundred percent. It's yeah. meeting with customers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're the decision makers. <laughs> Correct. Spreadsheets and KPIs. There's, they're byproducts. Correct. Agreed. Yeah. And so was your motivation uh, to build a career? Was your motivation that you had saw what you didn't like in management and you wanted to fix it? Or? Well, so then after, after I got involved, then I really got in, in you know, really started to enjoy the coaching aspect of, of leadership. So then as I evolved, you know, on this leadership, you know, continuum, that's the thing that I really started to enjoy and, and to build. Yeah. And I, and I, and I start to call it a, a, um, a build or a run up. So what I ended up, you know, ultimately doing at Oracle and then again at Salesforce was how do you, you know, build a, I call it a company within a company, but you know, so the, let me give you an example at Oracle. My last role at Oracle was just post sun acquisition, which was a really weird acquisition for Oracle, right? It was, it was all, you know, acquired 80 <laughs> software companies and now you have stuff you have to put on a truck and ship. Yeah. And Keith Block, who led American North American sales uh, at Oracle, asked me to build uh, this, what was called an Exadata team, which was just a part of the Sun hardware and Oracle software engineered to work together. I was employee number one, <clears throat> and uh, we built that team out to over 100 people, um, took it from zero to 450 million in revenue in about an 18 month period. And that build is what really inspired me. <laughs> um, and because think about what goes into that. It's recruiting, it's coaching, it's business planning, it's strategy, it's building out, you know, what plays you're going to be running. And candidly, with that particular product, it was a game changer because it broke down walls between how customers bought that kind of gear. <clears throat> so when I did that there, then I've kind of pursued those types of um, situations since then. Yeah. And what made that work so well? I think it's the networks, the people, I mean, yeah. um, you know, getting the right, and you know, to your point, like the first thing I did was hire three leaders um, that were very, very good that also had a network. Um, and so then people would come to see the fun and the, the startup nature, I guess I'm kind of coming full circle here as we talk, the startup nature of building a business within, you know, within a bigger business. And did you and pull it, them from outside Oracle? Yes, we did. Well, so the initial strategy was to pull people from within the company and then that got... <laughs> <laughs> then you that met got, them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my peers didn't love that. So, um, so then we had to go to the, uh, to the outside and, um, and you know, the, the objective was to hire fast um, as quickly as possible. We made some mistakes, um, but, you know, we corrected those and, you know, it's again, this is something that I learned. I thought I'd learned at Oracle, but I really learned from Benioff at, at Salesforce was you want to be full head count as quickly as humanly possible. You want, you know, people to your point earlier, meet out meeting with customers. And so uh, I think that was the big piece of it. Then the other stuff was all necessity because we really didn't know what we were doing. <clears throat> and you may remember Mark Hurd, you know, who recently yep. passed. Um, Mark was very... Um, focused on this product. So I would have to read out to him every other week. <clears throat> and, you know, he's not the easiest person to read out to. <laughs> and so, so we're like, so what's the Very understanding? <laughs> right, right. And so we just, with the strategy we built was one of out of necessity and, um, and it worked. So, um, and then there's something that we reapplied then at, uh, at Salesforce, which was a completely different product, obviously CRM front office, and we focused in on the financial services vertical and basically did it again. And what did you see uh, that you did that made it a success where you saw other people either fail or stumble? So this is, <clears throat> I'm going to answer the question. I'm just trying to think how to say it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's a level of, I mean, I'll call it OCD, you know, obsession that I think a leader has to have when you're changing something or when you're implementing something new, right? It can't be, you know, the, the, the report of the week or the, you know, you know, the gotcha metric of the quarter or, you know, something that just kind of goes away. So when you implement a strategy or a new something, this level of obsession, again, there might be a better word. I think it has to be there. And, and teams that I've worked with know what's going to stay around and what's not going away. And then which ones may be, okay, this could be a fleeting kind of idea. But so what's that level of focus, probably a better word. Um, 
and and an unrelenting you know um, um, implementation of it. Does that make sense? It, it it does. I mean, I had through an acquisition of you know a three year experience or earnout at IBM, mm -hmm. and you know you have the golden handcuffs. So you really can't leave. And I was like, how do I get this thing to work? You know, because I had this, you had to hire people and you see, you get the internal resumes and you're like, this will never work. Right. <laughs> yeah. you, know, this, you know, selling stuff that's 30 years old versus selling stuff that nobody <laughs> knows about. Right. And then trying to get the internal stuff done. And we were like you, where you had Sun hardware, Oracle software. I had our own hardware. Right and our own software that was now being manufactured by IBM. Right. And doing, you know, the biggest deal in the company's history and trying to get the stuff built, shipped, booked. Right, 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 right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my, my hat's off to you because I had never had that ambition. <laughs> you know, I was more of a sales guy. Yeah, yeah. So I know the, the pain that you went through. How did oh, you... No, that, and, and the operational aspects of that last role was was very difficult. And then the beauty is you, you, you contrast that with cloud, right? Which is, okay, you do a contract and it's there. You know what I mean? The, the pro, I mean, obviously it needs to be configured and things of that nature, but it's a totally different ball game. <clears throat> yeah. and, and how did you stay focused? Because what I saw within that company was trying to talk with people without getting into the ditch of what's wrong. You know, it's like, I, I just had to like, Constantly. Well, you know the focus the focus tool so the the focus tool that i'll that i will reference wouldn't be an oracle example it'd be a salesforce example um if you look at you know if you've read mark's books uh trailblazer what's the first one behind the cloud you know he had a concept called the vidu mom which is his business planning tool have you heard, heard of that tool i've heard of it yeah yeah which is vision values methods um obstacles and measures and that was the planning tool that candidly Salesforce uses top to bottom, starting with Mark all the way down to, you know, an executive assistant candidly. So everybody has that tool. So as you, and I've used very, it's kind of, it's similar to an OKR, you know, uh, yeah. philosophy, but it's just a one pager just to stay focused and to, and to keep that and the whole team, because everyone triggers off of what Mark would post and then everyone else would have their, their, their business plans all the way down. Yeah. And you were referred to be on the show. What, do you think motivated those people to refer you? Uh, well, we've had a lot of fun with my team over, over the years. You know, we've done well. So it's not just, I mean, the fun, I, I think when you're doing well, you are having fun. But even like, <clears throat> you know, that, uh, that role, uh, that last role at Oracle, that was a very hard, matter of fact, probably the hardest job that I've had. Yet we had a really good time on that team. Um, <clears throat> and so there's been what I would say three uh, big blocks of my career. It was the first block was pre that that exit role, then that last role at Oracle, and then running financial services uh, enterprise at at Salesforce. So we were doing well. Um, so everyone's making money. Uh, we were having a lot of fun, uh, and we were you know evolving right because you know you look at the nature of the business, sales, and again I'm coming from a software B two B lens um because i've seen other guests on your show that that you know are, are different industries maybe b2c slant and things of that nature the nature of what we do it's I mean it's changed it's not even you go back 10 years ago um <clears throat> you know the the way that you coach uh the way that you interact with people how you communicate like all that's different but you know one of the big things that we did is i i, I and this is tough with covid it's really tough a big piece of how i would operate with were the quarterly kickoffs not just the the big you know the salesman we would get to, it was just one day it wasn't multiple days but getting everybody together and i like to think that my agenda had a ton of value <laughs> um and i got feedback that it did but we would just get together for one day and you know the networking amongst people and sharing best practices and and win stories and loss stories and you know and things of that nature was a big part of how we operated um but clearly it's, it's happening in a virtual world now yeah. um so to answer your question directly we performed and we had fun those were the two things and how did you sustain that because typically is the roller coaster. You have fun and then they fix it. <laughs> right. Right. That's a good way to put it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I've got a, a story. So it, 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 at Salesforce, we were on our third year of double digit growth. And this is one of those things where, 
you know, as a leader, you know, your, your, your job is to anticipate, right? And we're like, okay, how, how can I, how can we keep this up? And this was the, and, and by the way, the interesting thing about the roller coaster is you don't ask yourself hard questions. You know, you're like, okay, we had a good year. We're going to dip and then up and then down. And so after three years of double digit growth, we were like, we had to completely think differently. Um, how are we going to go to market? Um, and we came up with some very, you know, there's not a whole lot of innovative stuff in sales. Um, you, you know, and, and we came up with a go-to-market, or we, we tweaked our go-to-market in a way that was very innovative that gave, a, gave ourselves a fourth year of go-to-market. But we're asking different questions, which is how do you keep the machine rolling versus, okay, how do I fix it? You know, one of my favorite sayings, Brian, is you, I talk to a lot of sales leaders out there, as do you, and they're like, well, I'm a fix-it person. You know what I mean? I mean, I can turn it around. I'm like, anybody can turn it around. <laughs> like, <laughs> give me something that's broken. I'll fix it. You know what I mean? That's not hard. You know, the hard thing is how do you, how do you keep it going? Um, that's the, that's the tough part, but to your point, then ultimately (laughs) someone's going to break it, but yeah. Well, well, that's it because say you, you do 150, 200% of your number. Okay. That becomes the starting point next year. Right. the, The reps go from accelerators back to the base commission rate territories get cut things get mixed around. The, the mojo is no go. <laughs> right, right. Yep. Yeah. And, and that's it. That's a really interesting, you know, org design is something that I don't talk about a lot, but I view as one of my most important jobs as a leader. And when I say org design, it's all the stuff you mentioned. It's account assignments, it's quota deployment. Um, it's, you know, you know, what team is supporting what other team. And that's a really tough riddle to crack, especially in a growth company. Yeah. Um, because at, you know, again, at Salesforce, we, you know, Mark's in, and it's his, and he's been right. He adds capacity, right? Add sales capacity, add sales capacity. When you add sales, 15% sales capacity every year, there's a defined set of accounts and you got to figure out, okay, how, how am I going to you know deploy this? <clears throat> I've made all the mistakes in quota deployment and, and I think I've gotten it right a lot of times too. Um, and so, uh, you know, I've looked at two year moving averages instead of just, you know, growth, you know, you know what I mean? To try to, cause you don't want to chase the dips and you don't want to pun, you know, punish someone who's, you know, succeeding. And that's it because the, the natural thing is, you know, a leader wants everything to be equal. The problem is they're people and people are right. not equal. Correct. You know, you right. have, you have eagles, and have ducks. You know, one, <laughs> one model that's tough to implement, but that we, we did successfully <clears throat> um, uh, was having a team selling type of model. So you take, you know, we always call it an eagle, right? An A player. <clears throat> and uh, they have a, you know, a huge account, you know, monster bank, let's say one of the biggest. Uh, what we would do is we would promote people to be on that team that were uh, potentially more junior that wanted field experience or whatnot. So then you would have two people, you know, shouldering the burden of potentially a larger number, yet you're grooming someone under, it was a great model, um, but it's not comp hates it. Operations hates it. You know what I mean? So you think about, yeah, you know, how to implement it. Um, that's kind of how we try to deal with some of that. <clears throat> And why did you decide to go to yet another portfolio company versus going back to your roots, becoming the VP of sales at a series A or series B startup? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I talked to, you know, all the, you know, VC firms still out in the Valley uh, as, as well as the recruiters. I've, you know, personally, I've really enjoyed financial services. Yeah. I like calling on banks um, and insurance companies. They're very difficult to deal with. Um, but they do have a lot of money and they are transforming. Uh, and so I like that space. So the, you know, the decision, you know, to come back was one of, we're in a global business unit within Oracle. So it's not, if you, if you think about Oracle with all the products, matter of fact, earnings were announced last night. Yes. Yeah, so we're outside of the quiet period. Um, um, it's a lot of horizontal products, ERP database. Remember, our team focuses on things like financial crimes, core banking, treasury management, regulatory analytics, and I wanted to take a step deeper into that world um, because I've enjoyed it so much as you look at, you know, financial services. Yeah. I mean, I only worked in that space about a year, but what I found was they're very straightforward, highly oh, yeah. motivated, <laughs> <laughs> you know, compared to, you know, selling engineer to architects yep. within the, either the government system integrators or, 
even Atlanta. Atlanta oh, was re really nice and fun. It's, I mean, I'll, I mean, I'll validate. That. I mean, I live in Atlanta, but I, you know, work in New York City, and you know, to get a deal, to get a deal approved in Atlanta, you got to socialize it. You know, what I mean, you, you know, New York, they'll throw you out of your office. You know, out of their office. <laughs> yeah, and it's very direct. And I think, have you gotten used to that? And you've, oh yeah, oh yeah, like, I, I actually prefer it. I mean. Yeah. You know, I, I actually joke. I say I live on Delta Airlines and spend my weekends in Atlanta. Um, but I do like the uh, the New York pace for sure. And if you look at financial services, the two major, three major hubs are New York, Toronto, and uh, and Charlotte. Um, so it's kind of a mix. Yeah. And, and where do you see yourself taking your career? Um, I'd like to keep going. You know, you talk about, um, uh, you know, what would be the right you know, kind of run up again, you know what I mean, would be really interesting. I mean, ultimately, I think it'd be great to be a CEO, you know, the clock's ticking on that front. But, you, you, know, you, gotta look at, <laughs> you know, some of my mentors, I look at Block, and I look at Benioff, and, you know, in things that you read, um, you know, they're like, I remember uh, someone saying once, if I'm not a CEO by 55, I'm not sure it's going to happen. So that's where I got to just kind of balance, you know, where, where you go. But what I do like about sales is that, you look at the big companies and they're kind of segmented from sales consulting, customer success, you know, pure sales, even marketing and those different components. You know, there's roles that have responsibilities outside of simply, you know, here's a quota, go chase it. Yeah. And what advice would you have for, you know, kind of a first line manager who wants to move up? I would say, well, a couple things. <clears throat> I would say one is definitely build your network outside of just your existing chain, um, right? Because, you know, with product management, with marketing, with other sales leaders, you know, different mentors. So that would probably be number one, because if you're locked in that one chain, it's kind of hard to move. Yeah. Um, and, um, and two would be to raise your hand for any of those um, special projects or nasty assignments or, 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 you know, or whatnot so that, you know, you can get that kind of, you know, that kind of exposure. And then third, I would actually say, and this is one thing that is scary um, is people like, well, I want to fly under the radar and not be close to the sun. I would be like, take your CEO out on calls. You know what I mean? Take your head of product on calls, your CMO, your CFO, um, you know, those people like to talk to customers. And while, while the prep, you know, to take a CEO to a meeting, the briefing documents, you know, the logistics. Make sure it's a closing meeting or a good meeting. <laughs> the customer's not going to say anything, you know, that's going to make them angry. <laughs> right? So if I'd, I'd say those three things, build a network outside of your chain, um, you know, sign up for special projects or things that other people wouldn't do and, and you know, take your senior executives out into the field. Excellent. Hey, Steve, where can people go to follow you and connect with you? Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm on I'm all, all the social channels. So uh, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, um, as well as Instagram. Uh, and I did get a Peloton recently. So if you want to ride. Uh, we can compete against you. <laughs> that's, well, I'm sure I'll be behind. But yeah. <laughs> um, um, so all of those channels would be great to connect with. And, and I accept, uh, you know, everything on LinkedIn. And I do respond to every mail message on LinkedIn. So Hey, I hope you enjoyed that interview. Hey, I want to make sure you're checking out b2brevenue.com. That is where you can get a free copy of an ebook that I did. It's a real ebook. It's not um, uh, a fluff book. It shows and talks about how companies make buying decisions and how you can influence that from both a marketing and a sales standpoint, how to find all the people that are in the decision path and what they need to see, know, and touch and feel before they make a product selection. If your team needs some coaching, some help, some training, some systems, some processes that do work today, because we know what doesn't work, or you know what doesn't work, I'm, I'll show you what does work and how to connect and get into pretty much any account. Uh, it includes deal coaching and content community, and I can customize it for your particular company. Just hook Go to b2brevenue.com, look under training, schedule a call with me. We can talk it over or just sign up. Uh, you can pay per month or all at once, whichever makes most sense for your budget. Also, uh, I put out videos pretty much daily on uh, LinkedIn and on YouTube. On LinkedIn, it's Brian G. Burns. And on YouTube, it's Brian Burns Sales. Just search for that if you like 
to consume some video content. And if you see me on LinkedIn, uh, please put a comment uh, and a share and a like on some of the videos. I really appreciate it. I've got a company page for each podcast. Uh, This one, the B2B Revenue Leadership Podcast, where I put both content and humor uh, videos out daily and tell a friend about the podcast. Really appreciate you listening. Check out the show notes for all the partners and the connections you can make there. Uh, the coupon codes for the products to evaluate them, see if they're a right match for you. And we'll see you next time.